All right, good afternoon. Uh, we have another very special seminar today. In fact, we have only special seminars this semester. Besides. OK, uh, so as you know, um, the RI has uh, both conference awards at uh, INCRA, the uh, student, Best Student Paper Award and the uh, Best Paper Award. Uh, so we'll have a presentation for both of those awards. Started with uh, Leo Pinto, yeah. who is uh, a Abinav student, yeah. and we'll entertain us with the what got the best student paper. Yeah. Hey, uh, is, is, is this working? Oh, OK. Um. It's recording you, but you still have to Oh, yeah. So OK. That's what um, So hey, guys. I'm Laryl. And I'll be speaking mostly about my master's work, which um, the, the broad overview is on data-driven robot learning. So um, I'm thinking to focus mainly on the ICRA paper and then also talk a, uh, talk a little bit about what I'm doing uh, currently. Uh, so firstly, uh, so this is the ICRA paper. It's called Supersizing uh, Self-Supervision. So in this paper, we learn how to grasp objects um, by attempting around 50,000 trials. And we have our robot running for around 700 hours. Um, OK, so quick m motivation. Uh, let's say you have a robot. You have a table in front of the robot. And there are objects on, on this table. So how would you grasp objects on this table? So the, the, the traditional way is to use analytical methods. So um, in this entire formulation, you need 3D models of the object. You then have to like fit these 3D models on your sensory observation. And then you use some physics-based physics, physics -based, uh, analysis to know how to grasp these objects. Uh, another possible way uh, while using learning um, uh, is to use human-labeled grasp data sets. So uh, what this means is that you have human annotators, and you give the human annotators images of objects and ask them to label how the human would grasp these objects. But again, over here, the, the, the problem is that human semantics is very different from robot semantics. How a human would grasp an object is very different from how a robot can actually grasp an object. So for example, if you have an object like this over here, there are multiple different ways of grasping the same object. And a human would possibly not be able to annotate all of these. So what do we do? Uh, we propose a self-supervised framework where the robot senses the table, uh, chooses an object to grasp randomly, and then performs a random grasp on this object. Uh, so we, we do this for around 40,000 trials. And uh, this should pretty much show you how it works. So as the video is running, if anyone has any questions, I can answer them at this point. Uh, yeah. So when you ask the human beings to annotate, did you ask them to annotate from the point of view of a two point two finger crystal? Or how uh, oh, so, uh, so that is, uh, that's not a part of this paper. That's like a relative works paper. So um, they actually, they, uh, in their paper, they, um, the students annotate them. So they know what type of gripper they have. So they've annotated based on that. Yeah. So when people pick things up, it partly has to do with their understanding of how the mechanism works. But yep. it has a lot to do with their understanding of the function of the object they're picking up. Absolutely. You pick a baby up by its ear. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a totally valid, valid point. But if you're not able to pick up the object at all, then it, it doesn't matter how. So, so I mean, this is like a step, a step towards that. You, can, you, can, you could think of it as a step towards the functional grasping stage. But, but yeah, so uh, in this thing, we do not really care about the function of the object while we grasp it. So yeah, if you put a baby, it may, like, it, it may, yeah, it may just pull it from its ear. So yeah. Um, OK. So uh, now, how do we represent a grasp? So um, we use a framework which is described in this paper down here by Ashutosh Saxena. Um, so we use uh, a rectangle to represent our grasp. So essentially, given this image, we have a sampled 
patch and the robot grasps the object at the center of the patch uh, and the angle of the grasp is discretized into 18 into 18 pins so uh, so essentially uh, at every 10 degrees of angle we say that's the same thing uh, now from our from our uh, collection of all the data we have a lot of positive grasp patches and a, and, a, and a bunch of negative grasp patches. What this means is that we have uh, patches of an object where we know uh, if, if it is going to be successful if you grasp it at a specific angle. And now, essentially what we want to do is to give an uh, image and the angle at which I'm going to grasp this object in the image, try to figure out if it will be successful or not. And for this, we actually use a deep network. Well, yeah. So uh, you have the image. It goes through a, a deep network. And then it, uh, it, it spits out um, what's the probability of grasp success at every angle. OK, so results for this guy. Yeah, so we actually show that um, on, on grasping novel objects, if they are completely unseen, we get around 67% of grasp success rate. Um, if these objects are seen before, then we get around 74%. Um, and we also show some, uh, some, some trials on, the, uh, on grasping in cluttered environments, where we have multiple objects which are all placed um, uh, very close to each other. Uh, let me try to get that again. Okay. Uh, any questions? Where's the center of the gripper? So when you show the angle, uh, where would the center be? <coughs> so um, so uh, the the center will be at the center of the of the patch. So is there any difference in grasping like this versus grasping? Yeah. Yeah, because the image itself will be will be different because it's dependent on the center, right? So if I move it, even the center would would change of the patch. Wait. Okay. So yep. how do you plan the position of your gripper? Looks like your horizontal provides the angle, right? Yeah. So so uh, during testing time, uh, what we do is that given this image, we'll sample a lot of patches around it. So uh, le let's say we sample like a thousand patches in this image. And now we'll, we'll pass all of these 1,000 patches through the network, and we'll see that which one has the highest probability of success. So this is successful patch example? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What was the proportion of the hard negatives which is positive? Um, so it's, so if you do it completely randomly, uh, the grasp speed is around 8%. So only 8% of the time you're actually going to grasp an object. Um, but then if you use this, use this model and keep collecting more data, uh, so for example, we, have, we also have a, 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 a reinforcement setup where we use this model to now gather more and more data. Uh, and that we get around 30% to 40%. And then when we actually do testing, we go up to 60%. So, so uh, in the end, it's, it goes up to like 60 to 70%. So in your last slide where you showed the cluttered image, yeah. are you doing some kind of object segmentation? Um, no, uh, let, me, let, let me just go back. Yeah, so um, it's having an image uh, of, uh, is, let's say it's having this image, it'll just sample, um, it'll randomly sample a lot of patches, try to figure out which is the best to be grasped at that point. And then it'll just pick it up, throw it away, and so it'll have a new image again. This depends on a white background there, so to tell object from non-object? Uh, no, so there are even white patches. But in the training, uh, it has tried out a lot of random examples. So th in the training, there are like a lot of examples of like completely white patches, and it knows that it'll fail if it tries to grasp uh, a completely white patch. Right. Yeah. Can you tell a bit more about the deep network? Yeah. So, for example, the scrap of the Yeah. 
yeah. So, um, so um, this uh, the entire deep network is formulated on the uh, AlexNet. Um, so it is essentially the AlexNet architecture. Um, we we fix the first few layers. Uh, we fix all the all the convolutional layers, um, and then we actually try to learn the fully connected layers that that follow it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the loss function is actually uh, a binary softmax because it's a, you're basically trying to say, uh, given a patch and an angle, will it be successful or not? So it's, it's, it's binary, success or not success. So our training data is also like in terms of, uh, it's, a, it's a very binary sort of uh, input where you have positive grass patches and you have negative grass patches. So you want to like pretty much find the line between these. Is patch actually given as a color image or binary image uh, with the back sort of backgrounds uh, it's 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 the it's the color image there's no there's no background subtraction so, so if the same object with a different not same but the same shape object with a different color yeah um, it will do differently maybe yeah I, I, I think it'll probably do probably do differently, but uh, so then you can then you can possibly like do background subtraction and just change the background to what color it has been trained on, right? Yeah, that's that's basically my question. Yeah, you know, yeah. What is this learning? Is this learning the shape of if it's a background subtracted binary image? It is learning sort of orientation of the grasp. Yeah. So, uh, b b so over here, it's color, it is learning more than that. Possibly. Yeah. So, um, also, there's a um, in our in, in our entire thing, uh, the objects are not necessarily well separated. So there may be like a clutter of objects, and it's still trying to trying to right. pick it up over there. So over there, like if you try to do background subtraction, you may actually miss some objects that are like placed near it. Yeah. Yes. So um, the angles. So the angles of the so so angle is basically a continuous space, right? Uh, but uh, because we want to train it using a deep network and we want to use classification, uh, we actually discretize the angle into eighteen uh, into eighteen eighteen bins. So every ten degrees of uh, angular rotation is in one bin. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt again, but there in the paper title I read RGBD, so if that. Uh, that there's, there's no RGBD. Uh, All right, so it's a related or Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in, in one uh, example, you showed the uh, objects are like separated, and then another example, there's a flutter. Is that training and test space or? Um, uh, the oh, so um, these so these two images are just to show the objects it was it was on. So this is not it's, it's not running exactly on this. So over here is each object uh, alone in the uh, on a there are, there are no there are no other objects around that object. And then we also show in in the cluttered environment how it works. Is, is the performance increases the, if you make the objects separate? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, when there are objects very close to each other, uh, the access to specific grasping points is restricted, right? So, so uh, it's always better if your object is far away from from other objects than trying to grasp it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I have that after in my analysis slides. So okay. Uh, so 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 maybe I'll just I'll move on and we can we can talk about more analysis. So um, to analyze this, uh, what we did is that we first created a test set. So uh, uh, on this test set, we we first show that our method is much better than heuristic methods and also. Uh, better than a few other 
learning based methods um, so so this is the this is the the question you're asking um, we can see that when we increase the amount of data the accuracy improves but then i think at around like 20000 objects it pretty much starts to starts to plateau yeah any questions okay um, so at this point i'll start i'll start talking about other stuff i've been working on um, uh, so the first thing is uh, unsupervised learning of visual features so essentially the motivation over here is that we have so many robot tasks we have a lot of robot data so given all of this visual data that robots have collected can we actually use all of this data to learn uh, features that can be helpful in non robot tasks so uh, this is this work uh, it is going to be presented at eccb um, uh, if you have if you have questions about this i can answer after this after the talk um, another what can you say at least one uh, task oh okay the list at the bottom right so you have you learn features yeah. from this kind of interaction yeah. uh, to, to help with those robotic tasks. So can you say what are the visual yeah. features? Yeah. So, um, so we, we essentially have three robot tasks over here. We have the task of grasping objects, um, which, is, which is pretty similar to, to uh, something I've, I've already presented before. Uh, then we have the task of pushing objects around which is essentially if I want to uh, manipulate an object on a table and if I want to push the object from one configuration to the other configuration, how is the robot supposed to do this? Um, the third task is on poking objects. So uh, um, this is essentially trying to figure out how soft or hard objects are. Um, and using all of this, using all of this data, uh, we try to learn how to, uh, for example, uh, classify objects on a completely different visual task. Like, uh, let's say, try to figure out if a mug is a mug or if a bottle is a bottle. Uh, we also show results on uh, image retrieval. Uh, but again, I, 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 I haven't put slides for that here, so maybe we can, uh, if there are questions, I can, uh, I can answer them later. Uh, the next work that I've been working on is on uh, multitask learning where essentially uh, let's say let's say you now want to uh, you want to learn a completely different robot task uh, but now if you want to do it in a data driven fashion do you again have to collect 50,000 examples do you again have to run it for like hours hours on end um, so one alternative is to use data from different robot tasks and use that to supplement your own task. Uh, so, so in this work, what we're trying to show is that uh, by using data from the grasping task, we can actually try to do something else, like pushing objects around. Uh, so this, this is still, um, this, th this work is still under, under progress, but I'm happy to talk about it later. Um, so I mean, that's, that's pretty much all I had uh, for today. Um, if there are any questions, happy to answer. Yep. So I'm a bit confused by what you mean by pushing. Mm -hmm. um, there's pushing where the intent is to not topple the object. Mm -hmm. There's pushing where, where toppling is the whole point. Yeah. So and there's pushing where you don't care what happens. So yeah. Which is it that you're doing? So I think it's the thing where we don't care what happens. So um, so what we do is that we just randomly push objects around on the table, and we observe how objects change. And now let's say you want to go from one state to a different state. We now want to know what action to apply on the, on the, on the first state to, to reach the second state. So we, we really do not uh, have any constraint that, OK, the object should never topple, or the object should, uh, should, should always topple, for example. So don't you think it would be more interesting to choose those as separate separate goals and train separately for those? Um, it, it may be interesting, but I think um, that is also um, so depending on your on your task, right? So if your 
task requires you to never topple objects, then you may want to uh, you may want to separate that out. But uh, but but in our case, we just wanted to see if it can learn this thing. Just just in general, learn this uh, learn the pushing task irrespective of toppling or not. So how can pushing fail? Uh, pushing can fail when you completely miss the object, or uh, let's say you want to move the object from here to here, but uh, the object falls down, so it does not move from here to here, right? So, so let's say I want the object to move from this point to this point, but when I push the object, the object falls. So, in, so that if I had pushed the object at a lower height, it might have it might have gone there. So those are sort of modalities where it can possibly learn. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you change the, the cloth to something like the wood, uh, but at test time, uh, at training time, you haven't seen wood before. Yeah. How would? Um, I don't know actually, but uh, um, I think it it will still um, it will still do decently well. Because in the end, we, uh, uh, we we actually just predict directions to move in. So uh, even if it's wood, if I know if I'm moving in this direction and at this height, it may it may uh, it may be able to to actually to actually figure that out. But 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 I don't have like I'm not sure. Is this a closed loop strategy where you just do things and observe? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a uh, open loop actually. It's not it's not it, it, it doesn't happen on the fly. Um, there's it basically just senses once and then acts, essentially. Yeah. So because you discussed, uh, don't let me start off. How um, so? The question is, how do you how is it controlled? How did you manage control to control that? Because you said okay, you're using a deep neural network to find out the angle, but then. The other, the grasping motion mm -hmm. itself, you just give it like you have a function and you give it the angle and it will always do the same. Aspect. So, so I, so I think the the underlying idea is that the the input to all of these tasks are very similar. The input is always an image, right? So now, given an image, uh, if I if I can learn some generalizable features on this image, then I can use that feature for multiple tasks. I can use it for grasping. I can use it for for pushing objects. I can do it for I can, or I can probably use it for other tasks that I do not even know about right now. So um, so in in that way, for the grasping task, you may have it in a specific framework for the. For the pushing task, you may have it in a, in a completely different framework. But then, if you're learning some lower-level, some lower-level representations of the images themselves, that can be helpful for both of these tasks, essentially. Yeah. So, how, uh, in this work, how do you represent the state of the object? Just, uh, some object, uh, they are just. Uh, it's motion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so um, uh, the state is only the image of the object. So uh, um, there's no there's no explicit information of has it rolled or not. It's only the image of the object which is standing and the image of the object where it has like fallen down. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So for the earlier stuff, you were just using a parallel JavaScript with like 18 parameters. How would you, uh, your thoughts on are you interested in how would you extend that to a more sophisticated grammar? You know, either with sort of a couple of multi-jointed fingers. Or hmm. um, so, so I think this this is a very uh, it's a very difficult question to answer because um, so there's a so there's like a certain difference between going from a parallel jaw grippers to a three-fingered gripper versus if you go to a fully dexterous five finger arm or if you go to like a suction grip as well so that, that the, so like in transferring these models it would be dependent upon how different the grasping modalities themselves are right so if i'm trying to go from two fingers to three fingers uh, it might be easier than going from two fingers to like five fingers um, so essentially like um, uh, when usually people ask me this, I just like uh, I just say that you can just start off with this initialization of our of our model, and then maybe collect some more some more data using your report, and then just just try it out from that. So prop so you will not you will not require as much as much data because now you just have to uh, basically. Um, 
uh, transfer your information from the parallel jaw to the to the three finger. But but I do not have an answer of how exactly to do that right now. But I think it's a very interesting. It's a very interesting question. I think I think like uh, quite a few people have tried to work on that previously. I think Nancy has some work on it and Sid as well. So yeah. Pushing task. What exactly is the output after you are not after you input the image? Do you get like some torques for the joints? Um, like some so so uh, over here we just uh, uh, we just predict some parameterization of the of the action. So uh, over here we uh, over there we actually just try to do uh, linear motions. So it's just a straight line. It just it just pretty much uh, predicts a straight line in some uh, and and the direction of the line. Yes. Uh, have you uh, tried to run any experiments or study with the online fashion, like just like giving it ten examples, uh, getting the like, training and modeling? So the 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 problem with um, so so you are saying that uh, try to grasp and objects try to learn from that and then go again uh, for for another and more objects but the the problem we have there is that uh, you want to have a diverse set of objects so if i give like 10 objects that are, that are very similar you may actually learn on those on those 10 objects but it will not be valid for some other objects so what we actually do is that we we do something very similar to what you've said but uh, we do it for more than 10 objects we do it for like around 1000 thousand times and then uh, train it again and then again collect some more data for another thousand times again uh, train it after that so, so like, is, is there any change in the uh, loss function like uh, like the study I think that like you had uh, one so yeah yeah you can you can just example and then uh, test it and the other one is like, train for white space and what are the results for when you train it? Yeah, so um, I, I actually have results for that, but I can probably show it to you offline. Yeah. Okay, we should leave, uh, we should leave time for the uh, second paper. Right? Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Marshall, for the kind introduction, and thanks everyone for coming. And thanks, Lero, for this excellent talk. So uh, we all know it's extremely hard to even just take a simple video of the robot, and Lero made it 700 hours or something. So that's really impressive. Um, OK, so as you can see from this title, it's about friction. Um, so friction is a very old topic. People have been studying it. And in fact, we drew upon literatures from the 80s and 90s and using recent computational techniques to make it more tractable. Um, so this is joint work with Robbie, who's not here, uh, Drew, who's not here, and Matt, who's not here. <laughs> uh, but that's fine, I'm the messenger. Um, so let's first look at these videos. Um, so these folks have definitely mastered the art of beer sliding. Um, so if we want to build a robot that slides beer or is a robot bartender, it would be nice to understand uh, how objects slide and how the friction damps out the kinetic energy. We can try this out at PSR maybe. Um, so abstractly, we want to set up a connection between an action applied by the robot and the resultant object motion through something called a planar friction model, which is this grain blob here. I'll describe in detail what it means. And hopefully, we can have a robot that randomly explore the object. And together with some physics principle, uh, we can quickly identify uh, this ge geometric representation. So some of the motivating ap applications in robotics involve how to manipulate objects using sliding. The top two rows are, are uh, this is very old work from Matt, uh, and this is recent, not really, really recent, uh, but people have been continuing working on pushgrass 
I think Mike Kovo is somewhere over there, and Jen King has been working on this. Um, so you can use an open loop push plan to basically reduce uh, uncertainty in orientation. And here you can use a push grasp to grab stuff out of a clutter. The less obvious ones are the dual problem where uh, if you do a change of frame, right, so he, so he here, sorry. Um, the, so we want to design the optimal curve of the fence such that for all possible uh, initial poses of the objects, it will all be fed into one unique pose. This is commonly used in uh, assembly lines uh, and also uh, in locomotion. I'm not really familiar with locomotion, but if you do a change of reference frame, it's effectively uh, the ground is pushing the object, right? Um, so all these concern something called a planar friction model, where you basically connect twist and wrench. Uh, a twist is simply, a, you can think of it as generalized velocity in 2D. Uh, there's also 6D twist, but here we only like 3D uh, twist and 3D wrench. Uh, to start with, let's only look at the linear part of it and constrain ourselves to be uh, something called point friction law, where everyone is actually familiar with. This is the classical Coulomb's friction. Um, so here, uh, I'm using load instead of friction force. Load means uh, the force the object applies on the table while it's sliding. So it's in the same direction uh, as the sliding velocity. Otherwise, if you're static, then the force could be anywhere inside uh, a closed circle of radius. Uh, coefficient of friction mu multiplies the normal pressure force. So in summary, friction loads are within a circle and velocities are normal to the friction loads. So you might ask, why does it need to be a circle, right? It's quite often that the friction forces are not isotropic, right? On a uh, grain wood, it's not. Um, so we can extend this uh, classical Coulomb's law to uh, a generalized version. If we assume the principle of maximum dissipation is very old uh, in the 80s literature, maybe even earlier, um, where basically we're assuming uh, nature would try to maximize the energy dissipated or the power, like quickly dissipated the kinetic energy. So what that means is if you have a set of choices of friction and given a particular velocity, nature would try to choose the one that maximizes inner product, which is actually power. Right? So that implies if you put a point here, right, this is, assuming this is the set C, if you put a point here uh, and given that particular velocity, that effectively acts as a separating hyperplane. Right? So if at any point on the boundary there exists a separating hyperplane, you can prove it's actually convex. Right? So the set C is convex. And here's some experimental data. Uh, the data are collected uh, by the MIT folks. Uh, they use this reset mechanism so you can push around objects um, for lots and lots of times. And they collect the data in FX and FY plane. And you can see that for these three materials that are relatively hard, where dry friction mainly dominates, uh, the set of friction forces closely resembles a, a circle, but not necessarily exactly a circle. Whereas for polyurethane, where things are soft, uh, the principle of maximum dissipation does not necessarily hold. Um, so the generalized Coulomb's law can be summarized as friction loads are within a convex set C, and velocities are normal to the friction load. Uh, so for any questions? Yes, this are you making an assumption about the, the material type then? Uh, the yes. So. So this polyurethane, which is soft, uh, has a significant viscous friction uh, effect. So it's very velocity magnitude dependent. Uh, we're assuming that let's just look at solid materials where dry friction dominates uh, and the convex state assumption holds. Any other questions? Okay, um, let's move on. 
So things are a little bit more complicated in a plane where the objects, actually that object is over there. Uh, you can pass around it. Uh, it has three screws, uh, which we use as approximations of point contact. Um, so now, if you put a center of rotation here, which is the, uh, the red plus sign, and uh, you can compute the corresponding uh, linear velocity uh, direction-wise at each supporting point, and the load is parallel to it, uh, scaled by the magnitude of pressure, the, the normal force. Uh, so you can do that by summing up the linear component and also the torque with respect to a, a fixed frame. Here, because we only have three points, uh, we can solve the exact pressure. Right? So there's just three equations. You know where the center of mass is. You solve the unique solution. In general, this is not true at all. Um, in our experiment, we did a lot of three-point support just to be able to get the ground truth and verify it. It doesn't mean that our algorithm is constrained to three-point support. Um, so if you do that operation, meaning putting the center of rotation everywhere inside the 2D plane, and you plot the corresponding wrench, here's what you get. Uh, this is something called limit surface, which I will describe in a minute. Uh, you, as you can see that uh, it's a convex body, right? But it's non-trivial, right? You have this uh, flat regions uh, that seems weird. Um, so this particular surface is called limit surface, uh, first proposed by uh, Suresh Goyer, Andy Rina, and John Papa Papadopoulos. Um, excuse me for pronouncing your name wrongly. Uh, so the surface of all friction wrenches during sliding uh, is termed as limit surface, um, and the normals are parallel to the body twist. So. A concrete example, uh, as in last slide, if you put the center of rotation here and compute the wrench, you probably map to that smooth region uh, on that surface. Whereas if the, uh, the center of rotation coincides with one of the supporting points, uh, now you've got this ambiguity, right? So, because that point is static, you can choose any possible friction force uh, within that circle. Where is that object? If you actually push that object, it tends to rotate about one of the supporting points, um, which means you're effective operating on this facets. Um, so it means that you can have two different wrenches all sharing the same normal, the same center of rotation, the same point. Uh, so that's not very easy to capture. Um, so we can summarize uh, friction law in 2D place, uh, in, 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 a plane, in a plane. So friction wrench loads are within a convex set bounded by the limit surface and body twists are just the normals. So our goal uh, is to come up with a precise and data efficient uh, planar friction model under the quasi-static assumption. Uh, Quasi-static means uh, you do a uh, force balancing. There's the inertia can be uh, negligible. And such model shall be computationally efficient. So uh, there's some related, representative related work here. Uh, the, the most straightforward one is to directly estimate the pressure. One way you can do is to uh, discretize the supporting region and you've got a bunch of points. Uh, and then you set up a linear programming and solve for it. Here's the result from a Kevin Lynch's paper. Uh, as you can see that the center of pressure, or the center of friction, uh, you can capture that pretty well. But for the exact pressure distribution, not so much. Um, also, if you're operating just in the pressure distribution domain, uh, there's some difficulty uh, in computing the resultant twist given applied wrench. It's uh, not hard to compute uh, the corresponding wrench given twist, but pretty hard to do the other way. 
Uh, so in 1996, uh, Robert Howe and Kotkowski uh, proposed this uh, ellipsoid approximation, right? So given a pressure, you can compute uh, the maximum fx, fy component and torque component and put an ellipsoid at the center, of, uh, centered at the origin. So we propose uh, a level set representation where you don't, you don't need to know the pressure and it hopefully can capture the geometry better and be computationally efficient. Uh, so given a convex function hf uh, that maps an uh, input wrench to a real number, uh, we use the one level set to uh, map to the limit surface. It doesn't matter to be one level set or two level set. Let's just pick a number for now and use gradients uh, to match the velocity twist, right? So you take a point uh, on the one level set, uh, take its gradient, and hopefully that aligns with the corresponding twist. So what properties should this function have? First of all, convexity uh, means data efficiency or avoids overfitting. Uh, as you can see here, that's, again, that three-point supported triangular object. Uh, this is the ideal limit surface, um, and you can collect very few data and try our model fitting algorithm, which I'll describe later. Uh, if you don't add the convexity constraint, and here, because you don't have data across the, the 3D wrench space uniformly, you do something crazy here where you don't have any data. It also happens even if you have hundreds of data. Um, so if you want to be safe, add the convexity constraint, and it does a reasonably good job even for just 10 data collected. The second property we want to enforce uh, is symmetry and shaping variance. So by symmetry, uh, we mean that you can pick a point on the one level set right, and look at its normal. You get that twist. Now you map that twist to a center of rotation in the plane and rotate the, uh, in the opposite direction. Right? So that should give you a wrench by only a change of sign. Um, so that, that's what we mean by symmetry. And shaping variance in scale is uh, enforced for the purpose of quasi-static manipulation, where the magnitude of force does not matter, whereas uh, if you do just a scaling of your input wrench, uh, the corresponding gradient is only uh, a change of scale with respect to your original wrench, unscaled wrench. So uh, the predicted twists are parallel to each other. So the third property we want to enforce is efficient invertibility. So this is critical for planning purpose. Right? So, so let's say you want to, uh, um, somebody give you a, a twist you want the object to, uh, to follow, then this operation, which we term as hinf, should find the corresponding applied wrench. So we have proof that uh, in the paper, uh, the, the detail won't be shown here. Um, strongly convex, even degree, strongly convex, even degree, and homogeneous polynomials satisfy the above three properties. And a closer look at a force order uh, homogeneous polynomial, it looks like this, right? It has 15 terms. It's a summation of monomials where the exponent all sum up to four. And now we want to identify that parameter A. So the problem set up is you have the robot, collect wrench twist pairs, find the coefficients A such that the collected wrenches are on the one level set and the collected twist align with the predicted twist, uh, evaluated at the, point, uh, at the wrench points. So we can set up the optimization uh, as follows. So the first term is distance to the one level set, right? So the uh, collected data, you evaluate it and see how far it is away from the one level set. Uh, the second term is let's predict the twist uh, on a particular wrench point you collected. Look at its angle deviation with respect to the collected uh, or the data, uh, the twist data. So these two functions are just convex surrogate functions. Uh, and you can show that the entire objective is convex. The first term is simply a regularization. So things are nice. 
Uh, however, uh, constraining a general polynomial to be convex is proven to be NP-hard. Uh, so that's a problem. Fortunately, uh, if you're willing to say, oh, let's constrain ourselves to a specific family of convex polynomial, namely sum of square convex, I'm sure uh, the control people and maybe the Kosho would definitely know. Uh, so the sum of square methods have been, has been widely used in uh, the control community to approximate empirical original of attraction. Uh, also in the algebraic geometry community, so we have used their tools and you can show that the, prob the entire problem can be now reduced to a semi-definite programming, which is convex, that's nice. And you can uh, further extend this to an online setting where you basically collect data in a streaming fashion and you update your model online. So here are some simulation examples. Uh, the, the first column corresponds to two different arrangements of pressure. The first one is just uniform pressure on a rim. This is probably our beer bottle. Uh, the second one is just a bunch of discrete points on hexagonal region. The mid column is the result you can get from uh, a force order convex polynomial fitting after the optimization. Uh, and the third column is a quadratic or ellipsoid approximation. So it does a surprisingly good job in terms of uh, capturing the geometry. So there might be some deeper reasons as for why polynomial, high order polynomial can approximate the Minkowski sum of uh, ellipse. Uh, we haven't explored that. Uh, and if you see here, the, the ellipsoid model did a reasonably good job, but not perfect. So s some simulation results are shown here. Uh, so we report the arrow in terms of angle alignment. Uh, so this is noise-free training data. On the leftmost bars are uh, the force order convex polynomial model. Um, these are, this is without the convexity constraint. This is quadratic ellipsoid model. This is a vanilla Gaussian process tweaked to only look at the direction. Uh, and if you corrupt the training data to simulate reality, um, you get this result. And you can sh see that uh, the algorithm is still uh, pretty robust to the noise injected. So this is robot in action uh, collecting data. So we have ABB robot, we have a force torque sensor, and a point pusher that pokes uh, the object. Uh, and then you collect the force torque information and the small displacement information as approximation of twist. And here shown are the, are the geometries fitted uh, with even very few data with respect to the ground truth ideal limit surface. Um, so on the experimental results, we did two evaluations. One is, because uh, you, you can get the ideal limit surface for three-point screw, you can sample data from that ideal limit surface and evaluate it on those data. Or you can just use whole L test data. Um, it shows similar performance as in like simulation with Gaussian noise. Um, so once you identify the model, you can do a bunch of cool stuff. The first one is stable pushing. So stable pushing is an inherently robust strategy where you push objects with two points or an edge. So the seminar paper by Kevin Lynch and Matt showed that uh, there exists an agnostic analysis. There is, there's an agnostic algorithm where you only need to know the pressure, the center of the pressure, and here are all the hatched regions. These regions means if you put your center of rotation here and rotate about one of that point, uh, the object will remain sticking to both of your fingers as if it's grasped, right? So it's pr uh, as if it's a prehensile grasp. Uh, however, it's pretty limited. You can only rotate about this little region. Um, if you identify the model well, now you can use the inverse operation, right? So give me a twist. Right. I want to check if we build stable or not. Right. I only need to do the inverse operation to get the desired wrench and see if it can be uh, contained in the composite applied wrench cone. Right. If you do that, 
uh, here are all the red uh, triangular dots which correspond to stable uh, pushing directions and the gray ones are not. And this is what we term as aggressive stable pushing where uh, the center of rotation is very close to your pushing applied pushing location, so you have a large angular component. So you can change the orientation of the object faster. So the second uh, application we can do uh, is a position controlled motion model. Right? So in general, you don't really have control over the applied wrench on the object. Um, but we do have a pretty accurate robot. We can do position control. Right? So the model should answer the question of, given uh, where the uh, robot is contacting the, the object, given the linear velocity at the contact point, and the coefficient of friction, uh, tell me the resultant object twist and the contact mode. Would it be slipping or would it be sticking or even breaking contact? So well, we have recently proven that there, we, our numerical algorithm can converge to the exact unique result. Uh, so that's nice. Um, so in summary, we propose a data-driven but physics-based co convex polynomial level set representation of planar friction. So this physics space is important. It gets you to the right uh, hypothesis space. Um, and this, the second uh, point is model parameters can be identified quickly, uh, thanks to the recent advances in uh, sum of square programming. And in the future, we want to uh, uh, model this uncertainty. Right? So this is, again, uh, the big data set collected by the MIT folks. Um, they execute the same push 2,000 times and record the end position. And if you zoom in, you see three little clusters. Uh, so the distribution is definitely not Gaussian. Question? No, that's not a question. Okay. Um, so uh, how do we model this? How do we uh, equip our model with some uh, stochasticity reasoning? And further, how do we simultan simultaneously identify the model and close the loop uh, in terms of how to uh, come up with a controller to push object from A to B? Robust controller. Um, and the second uh, project uh, we're pretty excited is about uh, the full grasping process, right? Rarely do objects, uh, so usually we do a grasp planning, maximizing some uh, force closure metric, and you go for it and hope for the best uh, that uh, the object will actually end up at the position you plan, right? This is not true at all. S what really happened is object is pushed, either due to uncertainty or perception or maybe your robot actuation or even your hand, uh, it gets pushed by the fingers. The fingers do not touch the object simultaneously. It might be jamming. Um, so, how do we, you know, look? How do we use the details before the grasping? And how do we extend to the dynamic setting? Right, so where uh, there might be impact. Uh, your fingers hit the object quickly. There's you cannot just ignore the inertia force. And further, 3D pushing, meaning. Uh, the applied force would be, have out of plane component. How do you take that into consideration? So thank you. And all the code, you can get it here. Uh, you can run the code and, and see the pretty plot. Thank you. The beer sliding? <laughs> in your motivation slides. Uh, so you got the bartender sliding? Uh, yes. And this would actually arc around. So can you use your model to predict what force is required to get a particular velocity twist here? The second video. This one. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can definitely. So there's a dynamic simulation uh, experiment in the paper, which I did not show. You can definitely have a trajectory that you know, spins uh, 
with the center of rotation relatively far, but not that drastically. I think th there might be some equipment somewhere here. Maybe it's possible, but uh, I don't know. Like, th th I don't think dry friction qu quite work here. There's something funky about this video. Um, but you can definitely slide from here to probably there. Right? Not like right angle sliding. So I thought this was a nice contrast between the first work and the second work, because the first work was the strategy was just take lots of data and forget about the model. And then this one is focus on the model, and it just use a little bit of data. And we saw the difference, right? You use five examples to learn your model, and then the other one was like 10,000. Um, but one thing, and I, I hate to ask this question because I feel like I'm asking it to myself, but <laughs> um, how can you, do you think you could, you know, a model like this could generalize, oh. right? So this works for a specific kind of, um, what is it, when the, the function is convex, and it only yeah, yeah, yeah. for like these hard surfaces. Yeah. Um, but then that means you kind of need to reinvent, reinvent this whole model, like every time you do like a different kind of surface. So what do you think, you know, going forward, what are the options for? When you take an approach like this. Okay, so so let me try to understand. So so, so you're basically asking why is this? How can we generalize? How, how can we maximize the the generalizability, um, right? Either by data driven or by you know looking into the details of the modeling and hopefully can cross different domains. Um, so when I started my PhD, I had a background in CS and machine learning. And gradually, I figured that, you know what, Newton's law is the most generalizable uh, learner, if you would like to call it. Um, so, so we need to actually look at the physics, right? So why is this generalizable? Um, for example, if you look at the, So for the stable, for example, for the stable pushing, um, for the stable pushing application, right? So one thing I forgot to mention is the model is actually learned on a different surface. It's on wood. And you apply that model for a paper, hard paper surface. So why does that work? Because in the model, we constrain it to be uh, homogeneous, right? So if you just change the pressure uniformly, it's just a scale of your friction force. It doesn't matter. It, it does not matter as for ch how uh, to map between the twist to the uh, wrench and the wrench to the twist. And another example, um, here, so you would say, oh, let's learn the friction with this finger. Right, and now you change it. You change it to I don't know uh, a plastic 3D printed finger. Uh, can you still have this motion model? Yes, you can. The only thing you need to change is to the coefficient of friction between the object uh, and the pusher. Right, so you wouldn't need to run the robot with a different finger and collect data. But I do think that um, collecting lots of data to remedy your a physics model, a feed forward model, is critical to maximize the performance. Um, and as you said, there are cases that are really hard to model, right? It's really weird geometry, uh, extremely dif difficult terrain, seems hopeless. Uh, but we would like to start from simple cases and you know, get the model right, and next step would be closing the loop, either data driven or I don't know, some control algorithm. Okay. Oh, just one more question. Yeah, so maybe this is more of a question about Alberto's uh, data collected, but how different are these sort of limit surfaces? How different do they look for like, you know, if I took, if I went to McMaster and I bought a triangle of aluminum and I bought a second triangle of aluminum and I bought some piece of plywood and put them in different ones, are they likely to be the same or are they likely to be like 
completely different based on like microscopic surface roughness. So the MIT data set has 11 objects, 11 different shapes on four or five different surfaces. So I try to play with it. Um, it won't look that different if the pressure is uh, relatively close to uniformly distributed. It will look very different if, you're, if you have a, something like a table, right, where it's like four legs or, or even like two bars. That would look very different. If it's pretty uniform on a relatively, you know, like regular geometry, it, it, it looks like an ellipsoid or more looks like a football, a football shape. Yeah. Um, so in this paper, I saw you use three-point contact model, uh, but uh, in reality, for a uh, planar uh, hard object placing up a uh, not perfect and ground, uh, will that three-point representation change change over time? So, so, so first of all, this model uh, doesn't just do three-point support. It it do whatever supports. As long as you feed the algorithm with collected wrench twist pairs, it does the job for you. Although on a microscopic level, if you assume everything is perfectly rigid, then there's always three-point support, but that's never true. Um, but starting from three-point support, we can evaluate uh, the ground truth. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to know the ground truth pressure. Do you just know what challenge do you think you would foresee uh, when you extend your work for casting? So, uh, you're asking what, are, what would be the challenges? Uh, so, first of all, jamming is actually pretty difficult to model. Uh, and would you consider jamming a, a, a grasp? Some people say yes, some people say no. Um, so, or the question will be multi-contact problem, right? So when an object has multiple contacts, uh, each, each contact is moving in a different direction with a different applied force, what's the resultant motion? That's pretty difficult. Um, second is dynamics, or in general, uh, impact is very difficult to model um, and very difficult to actually compute, um, meaning optimize over impacts. And 3D pushing, uh, if you push high, the object topples, right? You can actually figure out the exact height you need to push. Uh, somewhere in the middle, it wouldn't topple, but your applied force would change the pressure, right? So the pressure would tend to shift towards this point. Right? So basically, now you have to deal with unknown pressure that is a function of your applied position. Right? So that's a... a a much more difficult problem. Whereas if you go below that threshold, if you go over that threshold, go below, things are relatively nice. Okay. The, oh, one more thing, sorry. Okay, okay. I'm afraid that I might be some very surprised. If the number of the contacts increase, so how does it affect your optimization and optimization? I would I mean the computational efficiency? Um, so the algorithm takes input of wrench twist pairs, right? So the exact pressure arrangement doesn't really matter as long as you, so, so, so I guess you're asking the question of how the algorithm uh, performs, so the computational uh, complexity, how, how does it scale with the number of data? Uh, it scales relatively linearly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Sir.